So in this video, I kind of want to talk about weld tubes, mostly, and how they function. For the longest time, weld tubes were a mystery to me. I didn't understand what was going on. And uh, if you look at most domestic carburetors, they're not really interchangeable. You can't take a weld tube out and replace it with something else in a Holly or an Edelbrock. But um, when I started playing around with Weber carburetors, that's when I started to understand how weld tubes function because the Weber is unique in that most Webers are designed to work on a variety of engine sizes. So you could have a 3236 progressive Weber that could be put on something as small as a 1.3 liter and something as big as a 4.2 liter. It's pretty common. And in order for the carburetor to function correctly, in that case, in that broad range of displacement, you have to be able to replace the weld tube. So here's an example of a weld tube right here out of a Weber. So this weld tube, you can see, has a bunch of holes in it. You can also see that it's a different diameter. It's got a step in it. And it's hollow. Well, not at the bottom, but at the top it's hollow. So Weber weld tubes are interchangeable. You can change them. And the reason they make those weld tubes interchangeable is because of the fact that the, the 3236 can go on such a variety of engine sizes. You won't see this with a Holley or an Edelbrock because most of those four barrels are designed for small block V8s. Or if you get one that's higher, higher CFM rating like a 750 or an 850 carb, those are for big blocks. So you choose your carburetor based on engine size and both Holly and Edelbrock offers a variety of sizes, so you would just choose the size according to what engine you have. So small block, probably 500 CFM, 600 CFM, big block, 750 CFM, 850 CFM, and your well tubes would be matched up to the displacement. One of the reasons that domestic carburetors typically don't have interchangeable well tubes. So, all right, this is an example of a Weber weld tube. This is an Edelbrock. You can see the Edelbrock has holes just like the Weber. So this, this is out of an Edelbrock four barrel. I believe that this is a secondary. So you can see we have the secondary Venturi, the secondary booster, which is attached to the weld tube. This is typically immersed in fuel. And at the top, you can see air bleeds. Now, on a domestic carburetor, those air bleeds are typically fixed. On something like a Weber, the air bleeds are interchangeable. Once again, because the Weber is designed so that it can be used on a variety of engine displacements. So, here's a Holly example. Do Hollies have well tubes? Well, yes, they do, and you can see right there, you can see these drillings in the casting that have been plugged, and these outer ones are the idle tubes, idle well tubes, and the inner ones are the main jet well tubes. And if we flip it over, you can see that we have air bleeds. There's an air bleed there. Here's an air bleed here. Here's another example of a metering block. You can see this one's very similar, but this one also has holes in the well tube, just like the Weber and the Edelbrock. Not quite so many, but still has holes. Where this particular example of a Holly metering, Holly metering block doesn't have that. No holes. So different application. 
obviously a different fuel curve. So what is the purpose of these holes? So the big revelation for me as far as well tubes is understanding the function of these holes. And the big deal here is that these holes work in conjunction with the air bleed and the jet to do something in the carburetor to change the fuel curve. So here we see a very crude drawing of a typical carburetor. We have our float bowl on the left that's full of fuel. We have our jet at the bottom of the float bowl. That's how the fuel gets into the main well. And we see our main well. Now the main well is sealed except for the jet, the air bleed, and the booster. So we have a, a vacuum signal on the booster with engine speed. We have an air bleed which allows air into the main well. And we have a jet which allows fuel into the main well. Here is the interesting thing about the way well tubes function. At low engine speeds, our fuel level will be high in the main well. As Venturi signal increases, what ends up happening is the jet can't supply enough fuel to the main well to keep the level in the well tube full. So as Venturi signal increases, the fuel in the main well will drop. And as it drops, it uncovers holes in the well tube. When the holes are uncovered in the well tube, the Venturi signal will pull air through the holes instead of fuel out of the well. So we have a curve. As the fuel level drops with the increasing engine speed, it pulls more air than fuel. So it ends up allowing that fuel flow to be linear and stay at the same air-fuel ratio, roughly. So now you can see that I've drawn this fuel level in the float bowl to be below this first hole. I did that intentionally to prove a point. Fuel level is critical in the float bowl. If you set it too low and you uncover a hole in the well tube, the uppermost hole, then you're going to have to run a, a much larger jet than you would normally run because you've already started pulling air through the, the well tube. That's not an ideal situation. So what you could do in this situation is just simply plug that hole and get rid of it. So if you had to run an extremely low fuel level for off-road use, perhaps, then you'd want to solder that shut so that it wouldn't be pulling air. And then you could reduce your jet size to something more normal. So that's the magic of well tubes. As signal increases in the booster, and the vacuum increases, Venturi vacuum increases on the well tube, it starts siphoning fuel out of this well tube. The jet restricts how much fuel gets into the well tube. The air bleed allows air in. And as the signal increases, the jet can only supply so much fuel, so the fuel level starts to drop, and it starts to uncover more holes in the well tube, which leans out the mixture so that we don't have an overly rich condition with higher engine speeds. So, this is what a lot of people don't understand. When you start changing air bleeds in a carburetor, it completely changes its relationship with the way the well tube works. Same thing with jet size. If you go from a number 63 Holly jet to a number 73 Holly jet, you're allowing much more fuel in, which makes it richer, of course, but you're also upsetting the balance between the air bleed and the jet. Now the jet is supplying more fuel, so the fuel level might not drop as rapidly or as quickly, and you might have an overly rich condition at higher engine speed. Same thing if you drill an air bleed in a carburetor. If you start upsizing the air bleed, two things can happen. 
number one, it can delay the main circuit because the main circuit will pull air up to a certain engine speed. And then once it reaches that engine speed and the vacuum is sufficient, then it can start pulling fuel as well. So a bigger air bleed can, number one, it can delay when the main circuit starts, which can cause a bog. And number two, if you're allowing more air into the main well, then because this jet is remaining the same size, now we have more air than fuel, and this will start dropping prematurely, and we might get a lean condition at higher engine speeds. So this whole relationship between the air bleed, the jet, and the, the holes in the well tube is critical for the proper operation of a car. The only real way to figure that out is with a wideband sensor and a lot of data logging to figure out where you're at and what you're doing. And, and you have to kind of eliminate the transfer slot out of that equation. If there's overlap there, it'll send you in the wrong direction. It's, it's very critical, which is why you really shouldn't be drilling air bleeds in a carburetor. If you have a carburetor that's not functioning correctly on your engine for whatever reason, you should probably pick a different carburetor. Air bleeds aren't really something you want to monkey with unless you really know what you're doing. Because if you upset this balance between the well tube, the air bleed, and the jet, it's just not going to run right. So that's the big thing about well tubes. Um, you can take a, a Holly or an Edelbrock and you can drill and tap the air bleed hole and put removable air bleeds, which um, would probably be the best way to do it if you're going to experiment with air bleeds because then you could just go back to the stock size if it didn't work out for you. But um, yeah, very critical. Hollies come, you can get Hollies that have screw in air bleeds all the way down this length here. You can have four or five of them. And you can change the size of them. You can plug them off. And you could do a lot of fine tuning that way. But like anything else, when you add that many adjustments, it's hard to figure out where you are. So air bleeds are probably better left for the dyno guys and the racers. And uh, for us street types, we just need to pick the right carburetor to start with and run it. But I hope that helps. Air bleeds were something of a mystery to me for the longest time. And then I started working with Weber's and a lot of the documentation with Weber's was very informative and I started to learn exactly what's happening in a well tube as Venturi signal increases. And uh, it's good to know. So there, that's the up and down of well tubes. I hope that helped. Thanks for watching.